Great, thank you very much. So uh, I was asked to talk today a little bit about the recent 2017 HRS era consensus statement on AF ablation. Uh, and uh, these are my uh, disclosures. And I just want to say that this was a very big effort. Uh, I was uh, very uh, honored and privileged to be involved in writing the clinical trials section, uh, but I really do have to give uh, all of the credit to Hugh Calkins, who is our, our fearless leader throughout this entire process. And it was really quite the impressive uh, process to be involved with. Uh, the guideline was really a cooperative effort uh, of societies all across the globe. So obviously the Heart Rhythm Society was the major driver of the guidelines, but of course we had uh, the uh, Latin America Society, uh, Solius, as well as uh, ECAS, the European Heart Rhythm Association, as well as APHRS representatives. So to have that many people involved and on teleconferences was quite a logistical effort. And I congratulate Hugh uh, on bringing us all together. I think if we look at the 2017 guideline, it's important really to understand, first of all, what were the differences between the 2012 guideline and the 2017 guideline? And that's really what I'm gonna focus on. And then I'm also going to focus on some controversial areas where people continue to sort of, uh, frankly, criticize the guidelines and say, well, why, why do you still maintain certain elements uh, that so many people seem to criticize? So this was really a comprehensive uh, state-of-the-art review. Uh, as I said, the document was a joint partnership between different societies. And if you can imagine, this was 60 authors 268 pages, nine figures, 13 tables, and just shy of 1,400 references. So this is really a very comprehensive document. And if you're looking to understand anything about the field of either surgical or endocardial uh, atrial fibrillation ablation, this is the place to look. I want to highlight some new definitions of atrial fibrillation that were included in this document. Uh, first of all, a lot of people ask, what is an atrial fibrillation episode? And traditionally, this has involved documenting atrial fibrillation for longer than 30 seconds. However, uh, if you look at all of the older atrial fibrillation trials, they often required the presence of atrial fibrillation throughout an ECG recording, uh, a standard 12 lead ECG, which of course is not necessarily equivalent to 30 seconds. But the feeling was that if you're lucky enough to get a 12 lead ECG and happen to see the patient in atrial fibrillation throughout that 12 lead ECG, they're probably having a lot more atrial fibrillation than just 30 seconds. You'll also notice that we came up with a new category of persistent atrial fibrillation, which is called early persistent atrial fibrillation, which is defined as AFib that is sustained beyond seven days, but is less than three months in duration. And a lot of people ask, well, why on earth did you come up with that definition? How did you come up with the definition? It was very much expert opinion, so there isn't any specific data on which this definition could be based. But it was an attempt to try and subdivide the persistent population into a group that may be more likely to respond similarly to the paroxysmal population than, let's say, the long-standing persistent population. So I think that the real important take home point of this is that all persistent AF patients are not the same. And how do we differentiate those who are more like the paroxysmal subset versus those who are more like the long-standing persistent subset? We really don't know what the answer to that is, but the consensus document was willing to sort of put it, stick its neck out there and say, here's a definition that you may be able to use. And of course, the terms chronic AF and lone AF are now very much out of fashion and the document recommends that those terms be simply put to rest. <laughs> 
There's a lot of uh, now enhanced section on the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. If you look at the 2012 document, of course, we talked about PD triggers. We talked about uh, some aspects of multiple wavelet hypothesis. But of course, since that time, there have been numerous breakthroughs in terms of our understanding of the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation, and there are now enhanced sections on endoepicardial breakthrough, fibrosis, and of course, rotational activation. Uh, rotational activation is sometimes referred to as rotors, but of course, rotors have a very specific definition, looking at phase singularities, and in physics, they have a very specific definition for what is a rotor. And we don't actually know whether the rotations that we are documenting in atrial fibrillation are in fact truly rotors or not. And so using a more agnostic term like rotational activation is probably more accurate. Uh, this was a new figure that was included in the document where it tries to show or illustrate some of these newer mechanisms. And uh, you know, I could give you guys a multiple choice test to ask which mechanism is being illustrated by each figure, uh, but the answers are basically here, looking at multiple wavelets, rapidly discharging foci, uh, rotational activation, and of course, endocardial, epicardial breakthrough. Just emphasizing this concept of being agnostic, I think it's very, very important that we be very careful about how we refer to some of these mechanistic origins of atrial fibrillation. And I'll tell you that this is not a part of the consensus document, and this is, uh, I guess, the world according to me. So uh, take it with the, the largest grain of salt possible. But you, know, you can see that you can look at uh, both mappable and theoretical uh, bases for all of the different mechanisms that we have in atrial fibrillation and whether we're dealing with a focus or a localized rotational activation. You know, a localized rotational activation may indeed be due to a rotor, but it may also be due to reentry or anisopatry, which uh, you have to keep in mind. So I think this is just a way of t reminding everyone that before we rush to use terms like rotors and other mechanistic terms, we should perhaps take a step back and use something a little more, a bit more agnostic until we have a better understanding of what the underlying mechanism is. Lifestyle management became a very important topic in atrial fibrillation over the last couple of years and certainly since the 2012 document. So there's an entire new section in the 2017 guidelines <coughs> recognizing more fully that there are in fact modifiable risk factors which can alter the outcome of atrial fibrillation in and of itself but also alter the outcome of AF ablation. And now there are specific sections on obesity, sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, alcohol, as well as exercise. And pointing out that exercise on the extremes can contribute to atrial fibrillation. So if you're not exercising enough, you may be obese and therefore need to increase your exercise. But if you're increasing your exercise to the level of a marathon runner, or an obsessed Iron Man uh, contestant, then certainly you may actually be increasing your risk of atrial fibrillation down the road. So if we look at the new non-ablation strategies, you can see that all of them received a class 2A indication. So because of the lack of any very large randomized study, they couldn't get a class 1 recommendation. But certainly based on the smaller randomization studies, uh, there was a statement that weight loss is very, very useful in the treatment of patients. It's reasonable to consider the patient's body mass index when considering the risks, benefits, and outcomes of ablation. And of course, we should all be having a very low threshold for screening for sleep apnea, as well as treating sleep apnea aggressively, whether you're going to ablate your patient or not. Uh, this is a new figure really just illustrating that 
technology has advanced over time, so whereas the 2012 document almost uh, completely referred to RF ablation, we now understand that there are more technologies available with cryoablation being the major new dominant force. If we look at indications for catheter ablation, we see that the indications have been a little bit advanced compared to the indications that were included in the 2012 document. So if we look here, we can see that certainly it's class one to recommend catheter ablation after you have failed antiarrhythmic drug therapy, but it's now considered class 2A in order to recommend catheter ablation as first-line therapy, particularly for the paroxysmal patients. And you might ask, well, why was it recommended as class 2A to go to first-line therapy for persistent atrial fibrillation? And that's based on the fact that the performance of atrial antiarrhythmic drugs in the persistent AF population tends to be very, very poor and is not supported by the same kind of class of evidence as antiarrhythmic drugs were supported for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So there is actually a, a lower threshold, if you will, for proposing first-line ablation for your patients with the exception of long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, where catheter ablation still remains a class 2B recommendation based on the relatively poorer outcomes of ablation in this population. There were always in the guideline a number of different populations or subgroups that were identified as being particularly, uh, as particularly benefiting from ablation. Uh, but two subgroups in particular that were added this year were, of course, the congestive heart failure patient population, which was based in part on Castle AF and other studies looking at the performance of atrial fibrillation in the congestive heart failure population. But the other group that was a little bit controversial uh, in some of the discussions, and Frank, I think you were there in some of those discussions as well, was the asymptomatic atrial fibrillation patient because, of course, symptoms have always been the basis on which we have recommended ablation for most patients. So the question is, are there patients with asymptomatic atrial fibrillation who may still benefit? And I guess that depends in part on what your definition of asymptomatic atrial fibrillation is because, of course, we often see patients who are in persistent atrial fibrillation, and you ask them, well, are you having any symptoms? And they say, no, I, I feel absolutely fine. And yet, when you put that patient through a diagnostic cardioversion procedure, they may come back and tell you, gosh, I haven't felt this good in years. And so, asymptomatic may be symptoms that are not yet realized. Or you may have a truly asymptomatic patient, but that patient, for example, may be 22 years old, and you're sort of thinking to yourself, do you really want to keep this 22-year-old patient in atrial fibrillation for the rest of their life, or do you want to restore somebody's rhythm? So there's an acknowledgement in the document here, only class 2B, that there may be asymptomatic patients who qualify for ablation for atrial fibrillation. As we know, uh, there were numerous techniques for adjuvant ablation uh, beyond just pulmonary vein isolation. And some of these uh, adjuvant techniques like complex fractionated electrograms and linear ablation were in fact supported to some degree by the 2012 consensus document. Uh, but of course, in light of STAR AF2, Chase AF, and a number of other studies, uh, that argument was sort of put to bed a little bit and questioned the utility of some of these adjuvant strategies over PVI alone. And so this is now acknowledged by the new 2017 document. So if we look first of all at what the document says, it says that PVI is still very much the cornerstone for AF ablation. Uh, 
and that electrical isolation, as demonstrated by a minimum of entrance block into the pulmonary vein, is required whenever you're doing an atrial fibrillation ablation procedure. Interestingly, uh, we did recommend that there should be at least a 20-minute waiting period from the time of applying your last ablation lesion within the vein to the time that you recheck the vein for ongoing entrance block. But when it came to other methods of documenting block, for example, the administration of adenosine, we did not feel that the adenosine literature was strong enough to support routine use of adenosine provocation, use of a pace capture technique along the line of ablation. Again, we didn't feel the literature was strong enough. And even for the demonstration of exit block, given that so often, whenever you have complete entrance block, you're also going to have complete exit block, we only gave these a recommendation of class 2B. So for those of you who are wondering whether you have to implement these techniques in your everyday practice, the answer is probably not. The only adjuvant ablation that was recommended with any strength was that if a patient has a history of typical atrial flutter, it's worth considering putting a CTI line in addition to your PVI. If you are going to put any lines into your ablation lesion set, you must make sure that the line is complete and preferentially demonstrate that with bidirectional block. If you happen to find a focal trigger that is routinely initiating atrial fibrillation, it may be very important and useful to eliminate that PV trigger. And when performing atrial fibrillation with a force sensing RF ablation catheter, uh, the group agreed that a minimum targeted force should be 5 to 10 grams. And I think that's very, very important because in the literature out there, especially with some of the sub-analyses of the early contact force literature, there were suggestions that you needed a minimum contact force of 20 grams or a minimum FTI of 400 gram seconds. And in fact, depending on the power that you use, the duration of your lesions, an FTI of 400 may be excessive, a contact force of 20 grams may be overly aggressive, and in fact, some of the early risks of perforation that we're seeing with contact force sensing technology may have been due to the fact that people were irrationally targeting these numbers that really had no meaning in the real world. And I think as we start to understand duration, power, as well as more complex indices like the ablation index, we're going to get a lot smarter about how we introduce contact force into our ablation lesions. All of the other stuff got a 2B recommendation. So whether it's posterior wall isolation, <coughs> administration of high-dose isoproteranol, linear ablation, complex fractionated electrograms, autonomic ganglia, you name it, it's all covered here. And you can see that all of it gets a class 2B recommendation with a low quality of evidence. Periablation anticoagulation obviously has changed a great deal in the last five years. Of course, we had the COMPARE trial, which showed us that continuous warfarin was superior to interrupted warfarin and bridging low molecular weight heparin for anticoagulation around the time of an ablation. And now there have been numerous NOAC trials showing that uninterrupted NOAC therapy can be just as useful and just as safe as uninterrupted warfarin therapy. Of course, we had Venture AF, which studied rivaroxaban, Recircuit, which looked at dimigitrab, Exafa, AFNet5, which looked at apixaban, and the Eliminate trial has completed enrollment with adoxaban, but we still do not have the follow-up results, and hopefully we'll see that sometime early next year. So if we look at the recommendations, they basically say that patients who are undergoing AF catheter ablation should be put on continuous oral anticoagulation either with warfarin or bigotran. <coughs> 
Uh, Dabika Tran was given a class 1A level of evidence because of the fact that the Recirca trial actually showed a reduction <coughs> in bleeding events with continuous Dabika Tran versus warfarin, whereas Rivaroxaban got a class B because it showed equivalence. Uh, you'll notice that only Dabigatran and Rivaroxaban are listed because Aksafa did not come out in time for the consensus statement, but I think it's fair to say, based on the Aksafa results, that we would have included a Pixaban here, and once eliminate, uh, uh, the results are known, you probably could also add the Doxaban there as well. The other important thing for uh, peri uh, during the ablation is we are recommending that the ACT really should be at least 300 seconds. In the older document, there was a little bit of a hedge that said 250 to 300 seconds, but now I think it's been fairly well accepted and established that over 300 seconds is really where you need to target. Of course, after AF ablation, NOAC or other anticoagulation should be continued for a minimum of two months, regardless of the risk profile of the patient, and that's given a class one indication. And then decisions regarding long-term oral anticoagulation should be based on the risk profile of the patient as opposed to the success of the ablation procedure. Now, this was something that, you know, again, I can see Frank sort of smiling because we had a lot of debate about this. You know, if a patient truly is not having any more atrial fibrillation a year post-ablation, do you really need to continue the oral anticoagulation? The reality is that although there are a number of very large, well-respected practices that are routinely doing this, we don't yet have randomized trial information to support whether or not this is a useful strategy. And so when we get to the clinical trial section, you'll see that this remains one of the still outstanding items that we need to answer in our field of AF ablation. Uh, for those of you who are surgeons in the room, uh, the surgeons were represented in the guideline document, but standalone surgical ablation of atrial fibrillation did not get very high ratings. Uh, if anything, surgical ablation was really only recommended if patients had already failed endocardial ablation with an electrophysiologist, or if after an extensive discussion of the risks and benefits of surgery versus non-surgery, the patient said, yes, absolutely, I want surgery, I do not want an endocardial ablation, then fine, you can agree to go ahead. But the recommendation, whether it's for persistent AF or for paroxysmal AF, was not very strong for standalone surgical AF ablation. So for the surgeons in the audience who uh, wish to throw tomatoes, please reserve that for the latter part of the talk. There's a very nice summary table now on signs and symptoms that you should watch out for post-AF ablation. And for those of you who are doing AF ablation and you want to support your referring doctors, because as you know, most of these patients will present with these symptoms to their referring doctors, I think this table is a really, really great resource. And I've actually photocopied this table and sent it around to my referring doctors so that when patients present post-ablation with chest pain or when they present with fever, you know, they're not just told, okay, go home, you just have a little UTI, but in fact, the referring doctors can start to recognize some of these important complications, particularly the complication of atrial esophageal fistula, which unfortunately gets missed in our general physician population, and then the patients don't end up presenting until the very late stages to our institution. So I think this is a really great resource, and I congratulate uh, the individuals who put this together. I, I did not. There's also a uniform definition of complications. So for those of you who are designing studies or designing trials, and you want to know what defines cardiac tamponade, what defines bleeding, what defines a post-operative hematoma, 
This resource is now within the guidelines and is very, very useful and will hopefully get everyone talking the same language. And then the incidence of complications that is expected in the literature has also been listed. So when you're going to, for example, a granting board or the FDA and you're trying to design a trial and you're trying to ask yourself, what is the complication threshold that we need to beat in order to approve this technology, then these thresholds are now listed for you and can be very, very helpful in designing your studies. The clinical trial section basically acknowledged that we still need a great deal of clinical trial evidence in this field. And in particular, we need larger, larger multi-center trials which are outcome-driven. And of course, Cabana has been a very important contribution in this way. And over the next few years, I think we're going to look forward to even more trials like EAST and OCEAN and others, which are going to provide true outcome-driven measures rather than just AF recurrence as our only outcome. Uh, in terms of minimum documentation of atrial fibrillation, this is important, again, for those of you who are designing trials. So if you want to get your trial or study published, you need to show that when you were defining your population of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, there was a minimum amount of documentation that was done to prove that the patient had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And this is some of the stuff that I can tell you journal editors are looking at uh, when they're looking at publishing your work. The blanking period still remains the same at three months, but we do open the door to the fact that if you don't believe the blanking period should be that long and you want to reduce it to something like one or two months, as long as you're transparent about it, no one is going to penalize you but it has to be predefined in your protocol, and you can't just change the blanking period after the fact because your results look bad. The 30-second cutoff point for recurrence of atrial fibrillation still remains the gold standard for clinical trial reporting. And this is obviously a huge bone of contention for many people. What does 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation really mean? Is it relevant? Why on earth do we still have the 30 second cutoff? And the answer simply is that if we changed it to one minute or two minutes or five minutes, any one of those definitions would have been equally arbitrary. And then we also would not have had a common definition by which to compare newer trials to older trials. So that is why the 30-second endpoint remains there. But that does not mean that that's the only endpoint you have to report. And in fact, the consensus document encourages people to report alternative endpoints. And so if you look, for example, this was Table 2 from the STAR-AF2 study that we published uh, a few years ago now. And, you know, some of the reviewers were getting very agitated over the fact that, you know, they wanted to see this particular outcome or this particular outcome. They wanted to see it off drugs or on drugs, with flutter, without flutter. So, you know what, we just decided we're going to list every single one of these endpoints and just be transparent about what the results were. So we had this table two where we had freedom from AFib, freedom from all atrial arrhythmias, with or without drugs, freedom from atrial fibrillation after one procedure, after two procedures. I mean, we basically put that endpoint through a blender and just poured it out and said, you know, whatever endpoint you want to see, here it is, transparently given to you in a table. And that's something that we're encouraging all trials to do. And if you want to choose a different outcome cutoff rather than 30 seconds, be our guest. You know, and you know, you'll get different results depending on what cutoff you decide to use. But at the end of the day, somewhere in your results, you should report that 30 second outcome in order to be transparent. But if you want to report other outcomes, and again, this is results from STAR F2, where we basically sliced and diced it with uh, different outcome measures, and you can see that the outcome differed depending on what kind of threshold you chose 
for atrial fibrillation recurrence. So we suggest that there are other outcomes which may be very relevant. For example, time to first persistent atrial fibrillation, a reduction of AF burden. And that doesn't just have to be done with a continuous monitor like an ILR. For example, there are many very clever estimates of AF burden that are being calculated, kind of like TTR for warfarin, where you have periodic assessments but you kind of calculate what kind of burden based on those periodic estimates that the patients will have. So there are many, many ways to do this, but we would still want somewhere in your manuscript for that 30 second outcome to be reported. Minimum requiring, uh, requirements for monitoring. I think this is also important for me to cover because it's relevant to those of you who are publishing. For paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, we do expect a follow-up at least at 3, 6, and 12 months with an ECG and at least one 24-hour holter done at the end of the period, as well as some evidence of patient-activated recordings when they feel symptoms. And for persistent atrial fibrillation, it's exactly the same, except we recommend at least one 24-hour holter every six months. The monitoring requirements are really not overwhelming. And I think for those of you who are doing studies in this field, you should be able to get this kind of monitoring at a minimum done. Uh, quality of life is something that I think we need to understand better in our AF ablation patients. I think when you look at what's happening with payers in Europe, in the US and in Canada, quality of life and measurement of patient reported outcomes is becoming very important. And dare I use the word bundled care, but bundled care is something that is coming to all of us and PROs or quality of life is gonna be part of how we are going to be measured on that. So the document actually gives a very thorough summary of almost every possible atrial fibrillation quality of life scale that is out there, the pros and the cons of each scale. So when your administrators uh, or your clinical trial investigators are talking about how to measure quality of life, we've given very specific recommendations. We also encourage you to report on specific subgroups, in particular gender-based differences, BMI-based differences, and differences based on the presence or absence of sleep apnea. These are very important emerging fields. We need to better understand how patients do in these different categories. And the only way we can pool the literature together in that analysis is for all trials to start reporting outcomes in these particular populations. There are definitions of stroke and bleeding that are provided. So if you want to do trials where stroke and bleeding are going to be your outcomes, we have provided all of the key definitions for how to do that. So again, for the clinical trialists out there, uh, those are very, very important resources for you. And then finally, we have summarized the 14 top questions that remain unanswered in our field today. And I'm not going to belabor you with going through each and every one of these 14 questions. But for example, understanding AF ablation success and whether we modify stroke risk and the need for ongoing oral anticoagulation is actually at the very top of that list. But you can see that there are a number of different questions that remain unanswered in our field. And for those of you who are either senior investigators or junior investigators, these hopefully should form important questions that will determine the basis of your future research. So all of these questions are here. Again, I'm not going to read all 14 of them, but they're all listed in order in the document. So, take home points about the clinical trial section. Some things do remain the same, like the 30 second cutoff for defining recurrence and the minimum monitoring requirements. Reporting of other outcomes, however, is strongly encouraged. And at the end of the day, whatever you do, be transparent. If you're transparent about what you're doing, you're never gonna go wrong. No one will ever criticize you. 
So in conclusion, I just want to say that the 2017 consensus document, I think, is, is a great document. I'm very biased in saying that. Hugh Calkins uh, did a wonderful job of leading 60 individuals to create it. I think there are a lot of useful definitions and tools that are buried in that document, and I hope that you'll find them useful, and there are key unanswered questions which will provide fertile ground for investigation for years to come. Thank you very much. Terrific talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, Frank, please. Beautiful as usual. Okay, so two two issues. One, can you tell us what you do now in your practice based on the guidelines for the young patient with asymptomatic atrial fib? I, I think we all sort of try to get them to tell us that they were symptomatic in the past. Yes. Now, do we still do that? And what is the role for just shared decision making and that extensive discussion and how often do you do that? Have you taken a certain age cutoff, 50, 40, to, to make those decisions? Just how are you practicing? And I have a, a coagulation question. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So, um, you know, I personally feel that leaving someone very young in atrial fibrillation, either for the rest of their life or to progress over a very short order is, is not the right thing to do. And I always think back to this 19-year-old woman who presented with persistent AF that had been going on for four years, uh, a very strong family history of atrial fibrillation, so definitely some genetic basis. And, you know, she's 19, so she says she can run track, she can do this, she can do that, she can do a whole lot more than I can. Uh, but leaving her in atrial fibrillation uh, for that period of time was just not something that was going to sit well with me, and frankly it didn't sit well with her parents, it didn't sit well with her. So as you pointed out, that shared decision making, I realize that you're not terribly symptomatic now, but what's going to happen to you in 10 years, what's going to happen to you in 20 years, where you're still going to be under the age of 40. And so those are patients where I am, I wouldn't say encouraging, but I'm encouraging to have the discussion about what the potential benefits of ablation may be. Is there a specific age cutoff? Uh, right now, I would say personally that anyone under the age of 40 is probably someone where I'm having that conversation. Uh, over the age of 40, uh, I'm, I'm sticking a little bit closer to the guidelines. Um, is that based on anything, Frank? No, it's not based on anything, but that's just my personal practice. Please. So I just want to uh, make a comment. You have to admit that you don't really know what you're doing when you're dating a 20-year-old and what the result would be at the age of 40. Is she going to maintain sanitary? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you correctly point out, even after a quote-unquote successful ablation at the end of one year, there is an attrition rate every year between 2 to 5%, depending on the population and depending on how many ablation procedures you've done. Now, if I can delay the progression of atrial fibrillation by 20 years, because I've done the ablation 